Okay, so we're uh, online. Uh, good evening to everyone. Boa noite a todos. Uh, I'm going to speak briefly in English. Vou, uh, vou falar rapidamente em, em inglês, depois em português. So, welcome everyone to our first lecture with our keynote guest, uh, composer Panayotis Kokoras. Um, uh, this is the first lecture from our uh, SIM Festival, 6th edition. And uh, we're very, very happy to have uh, Panayotis here giving a talk, being so generous. And um, we're also going to uh, play uh, one of his pieces during the festival. So you're all welcome to, to attend the, fest the, the, the concerts. Uh, I'm going to read a brief biography. Uh, and then we're going to show you the, the link to his full website so you can learn more about uh, Panayotis. Uh, so uh, here we go. Panayotis Kokoras is an internationally award-winning composer and computer music innovator and currently professor of composition and director of the Center for Experimental Music and Intermedia at the University of North Texas. Born in Greece, he studied composition and class classical guitar in Athens, Greece. In 1999, he moved to England to undertake postgraduate studies at the University of York, where he completed his MA and PhD in composition. As an educator, Kokoros has taught at the Technological and Educational Institute of Kret and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece, among others. He was commissioned by several institutes and festivals, such as IRCAM in France, Gaudiamos, the Netherlands, TETKM in Germany, IMAB France, Siemens Musikstiftung in Germany, and prize winner of 84 international competitions, among others, Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship Award, Gigahertz Music Award in 2019 and 2009, Klang Composition Competition 2016, the Franco Evangelisti Prix 2012, uh, three times at the Bourges and Takemitsu Composition Award in Japan. Uh, agora eu vou ler em português uma breve biografia do Panayotis Kokoras. Bom, ele é um compositor premiado internacionalmente, inovador em música computadorizada e atualmente é professor de composição e diretor do, do Center for Experimental Music and Intermedia na Universidade de North Texas. Uh, nascido na Grécia, estudou composição e violão clássico em Atenas. Em 1999, mudou-se para a Inglaterra para fazer seus estudos de pós-graduação na Universidade de York, onde concluiu seu mestrado e doutorado em composição. Como educador, Cócoras lecionou no Instituto Tecnológico e Educacional de Creta e na Universidade Aristóteles de Thessaloniki, na Grécia, entre outros. Ele foi comissionado por vários institutos e festivais, como IRCAM, Gaudiamos, ZKM na Alemanha, IMEB na França, a Fundação de Música da Siemens, e foi vencedor de 84 concursos internacionais, entre outros, como o Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, o Gigahertz Music Award, duas vezes, na Alemanha, em 2019 e 2009, o Clang Composition Competition de 2016, em 2012 o Franco Evangeliste, é, o Prêmio Franco Evangeliste, e foi também premiado três vezes pelo Prêmio Bourges, da França, e em 2002 no Japão com o Takemitsu Composition Award. Então vamos é, caminhar agora para a palestra do, do, do professor Panayotis Kokoras, uh, Panayotis, now we're going to start, so all in English from now on, uh, with your lecture. Thank you very much for accepting our uh, invitation, and we're happy to have you. Uh, thank you, Felipe. It's my pleasure. Um, and again, congratulations for organizing such a wonderful event for sixth uh, time. Um, we we need this kind of support, and I think it's a, it's a contrast to uh, what's happening. Uh, there is a lot of ugliness there out there, and we offer beauty. 
there is a lot of deconstruction and we offer creativity. So we need this kind of events because they are just uh, helping correcting the world a little bit, just a little bit, but that's, that's good. Uh, so, okay, let me then uh, share my screen so I can uh, begin my presentation. I may need to do that a few times as um, we move along so that um, um, okay um, so you see my screen yes yes thank you I, I may do a few questions just make sure we are all uh, in touch uh, as I, I I have no visual uh, input uh, right away so um, so let's begin. I will start maybe my presentation with a slide that I normally like to show. Uh, and that kind of gives a little um, introduction to where I am. Uh, so I call my music um, sound compositions, sub sound composition. And I like to say that I compose sound. Uh, so while I'm working towards this approach, I figured out I have to reinvent somehow a little bit the wheel, if you wish. So I started thinking, what's a melody? And if I need a melody in my music, what's harmony? If I need pitch. So I kind of removed everything pretty much from my canvas, from my paper. And I had to reinvent all these uh, elements in the new context, which is the sound composition, not not based uh, melody and things like that. So here it is, no melody, no harmony, no texture, no idiomaticism, uh, idiomatic writing for instruments, and no standard instrumental sounds, right? Not that I don't use standard instrumental sounds, sometimes I will, not often and not much. Uh, so it looks a bit scary, as you can see, but um, there you have it. So speaking of that now, it's not, it's not so strict. Um, for instance, when I'm, I'm saying that um, uh, texture is not there, I will speak a little bit about uh, what I call holophonic musical texture, right? So it's not that I'm not using a texture, how else can you make music? But I had to redefine what kind of musical texture am I using in my music? And traditionally, you know, we have the uh, monophonic musical texture, one voice, right? Uh, the uh, polyphonic counterpoint, and then homophonic harmony and melody. Uh, so none of these three main musical textures were kind of suitable for my music. So I thought, I have to to understand what am I doing with musical texture. So I came up with this holophonic musical texture, which if we try to give a, some sort of definition, it goes like that. Holophonic musical texture is best perceived as the synthesis of simultaneous sound streams into a coherent whole with internal components and focal points, right? So different sounds that fuse into a coherent whole. Holophonic musical is the music whose texture is formed by the fusion of several sound entities uh, that lose their identity and independence in order to contribute to the synthesis of a whole. I will, I will give you a few examples as well, musical examples, so you can maybe understand better. Um, and as for the term, holophony uh, comes from the Greek words uh, Holos, which means whole, entire, and phone, which means voice or sound. So this is familiar to me, and it's easy to make up, to come up with words, perhaps. Um, so I will play here a few sounds, symbol sounds. This is the first. And you can even see what it is. Okay, four sounds. Now, if you try to 
um, in your mind sort of mix those four sounds uh, at the same time together what kind of sound you get um, I will not reveal it to you yet maybe from the components you see here you will realize but that's the mix <laughs> That's the sounds you'll get in real life, not the components, the motor, their flow. So this is a vacuum cleaner, you know, the, the one that you're cleaning your carpet and your floors. It's a vacuum cleaner sound. So a vacuum clean, cleaner as a machine, it has different components and each component makes a different noise. We have the motor noise, we have the airflow whistling noise, we have the section fan tone, the carpet brushes and so on. Um, but when you hear it, you don't say, oh, here is the motor sound, here is the airflow, blah, blah, blah. You just hear the sound as a whole and you identify it as the vacuum cleaner or whatever that is. That, that's the case with many sounds around us and including also with um, ensembles, music and recorded sounds that we use in uh, electronic music. Um, so that's a kind of a real life example, if you, if you like. Uh, and here I also show how kind of this could could be a natural evolution. Um, so from the 50s, we started having electronic pieces or pieces with textures, textural pieces. So um, that could be like a starting point. But of course, these dates are not like fixed. Uh, we, uh, Beethoven had moments in his music which was monophonic, solo oboe within a symphony or uh, even fugues and stuff like that. So it's not like that these textures are not bleeding from period to period or even they're, they're still valid to, till today, of course. Um, but still it gives me an understanding of this kind of... Um, development. So here I will show you another example, a little bit more musical this time. Uh, this is from a piece of mine called Hippo, um, from the animal Hippopotamus, right? Um, so this is a short fragment from bar 23 to 29. I will play first this, this, the, it's a trio piece for violin, piano and clarinet. I'll play the violin, the piano, the clarinet and then all together. Violin first. That was a violin, piano. And the clarinet. Okay, not perhaps the typical uh, clarinet sound or even piano and violin, right? Uh, and that also comes to what I showed you er earlier, that I don't use much the, st the standard instrumental sounds. Um, to, to compose sound, you need sounds. And the typical, you know, violin, it has that sustained tone that you bow very delicately and you study for 12 years to figure it out exactly how to do that that it has a correct intonation all the time, stable. It has a nice rich projection and color timbrely. Um, so these are the features you need if you have to play, you know, uh, traditional uh, violin music. Um, I don't need any of those qualities. And therefore, um, I try to find ways and I need more sounds. I need different um, uh, different sounds to compose sound. So that's essential. So here, let's hear the mix. It comes together now. So even in this small phrase, it starts a little bit more separate. You can still hear that perhaps there is three instruments, even if you don't recognize for sure what the instruments are. And as this phrase progresses, 
they fuse together, right? And of course, to do that, there is certain things that happen in our brain and our perception. And I me mean, as a composer, I'm aware of those. And then I'm aware of what kind of sounds qualities I need to reach that goal. Um, so that's, that's an example, for example, uh, how musical texture has been replaced in my practice and as well as the idiomatic writing or the standard instrumental sounds, as I said before. So now to, to reach that, uh, as I said, I need sounds. And, you know, uh, I can take the clarinet and do slap sounds. I use my teeth. Uh, let's say I blow without the mouthpiece. There is a number of things you can do. And that's, that's good enough. Um, for the most part, but for me, this is still not enough. So, uh, over the years, to get more sounds out of the instruments, I have uh, developed a number of, I, could, I call them instrumental prosthetics, right? And these are little um, pieces, parts, that attach the instrument or kind of interfere with the instrument and uh, uh, enhance the possibilities. So for the clarinet, for instance, I'm using um, what I call the ultra thin synthetic reed. This is a reed I have developed. And it's still in beta sort of version. It's, it's not yet sort of done, this project, but it's very stable now. It's very functional. Uh, especially for the clarinet in B flat. So for, for doing this read, I use a laser uh, cutting, 3D printing, and uh, um, um, molding techniques. Um, and to, I do that to get specific more sounds. So it's important with this read, the ultra thin synthetic read, where you place the lower lip. I don't know how many of you are uh, single reed instrument players, um, but normally you learn where to place your lips to have the best sound and perhaps that's where you lock it. Um, in this case, your lip is almost like a slide and moves across the reed from the really tip of it, really, really at the edge of the tip, all the way to the shoulder of the reed, which is Normally, you never do that with the normal uh, reeds. So, and of course, it matters the pressure, how much pressure you apply. It's very important. And the position across the reed. And of course, how much air you blow. For the most part, you don't blow much. You don't blow as much as you do with normal reeds. Um, so I'll play a few sounds that come out of this reed. So I call this sound, let's get out of here, flutter sound. And here you see a little bit um, where you're supposed to, to place your lips. You see that the bottom lip, the lower lip, it doesn't touch the reed. So actually to play the sound, you don't have to touch the reed at all. You just blow uh, to the uh, vertical to the reed or to the mouthpiece and the reed will start doing this flutter sound. So another sound here. Uh, another sound. I'll play the groan sounds. the clap sounds. Some of them, of course, have similarities, but they're not the same. And also some of them may sound to you a little bit like, uh, like animal sound, like vocalizations, animal vocalizations. I will go get back to it in a minute. Here are a few other types, a little bit more different perhaps.
plays with harmonics. Here it's uh, used the teeth. Uh, and of course you can play even ordinary sounds like okay you can even play normal sounds uh, may not sound the, the best clarinet let's say quality sound but uh, it's good enough um, so this way I can expand the repertoire I can do more sounds than normally a clarinet is, is capable of and that's for me vital. Uh, the other thing I'm very much interested in my music is that I, I, I have this interest and in, to connect the music to kind of where it belongs, in my opinion, right? And I think music started from the nature when, you know, um, um, the shaman, for example, in a tribe in the jungle would do make sounds to to scare the um, the spirits or to bring rain or to to make uh, the corpse uh, better what you name it right um, the hunters will make sounds to scare the animals and or cheat them somehow imitating animal animals vocalizations and uh, ca capture them so that's that's music Right, that's where music was used, and slowly but steadily, we placed the, the the sound, the music, into four walls in a room. Right, which maybe at first was more church rooms, churches, and then it became castles, and now we have concert halls. You know, um, but still we are enclosed. We are disconnected from the source, which is. Oh, there it's not inside the concert hall um, so uh, this way using these um, uh, modifications I can recreate more things and I can bring this outside world into the concert hall and um, perhaps you will hear more about that later um, so doing that I need uh, also a specific notation and uh, um, here you see some of these examples. This is from the piece Mutation for Clarinet and Electronics. Um, this is a piece called Rhino uh, for Barton Sax and Electronics. I'm not sure if I can play that a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. I cannot edit the picture, but uh, um, a colleague of yours from Brazil actually is, is playing it and uh, it was written for him. Um, so here you see the mutation clarinet piece the it looks like you know the staff notes but nothing is really exactly like that there is more lines than five apparently and they represent the keys of the of the clarinet and there is a, an area for the reed and that shows where the lower lip is touching the reed okay uh, also it kind of a little bit represents the quality of the sound, that the sound has this kind of pulse in it, rolling kind of thing. And also here, I show how much pressure the performer should apply to the reed. So there's all these layers, and it's very, very mechanistic. You just see what you've got to do, right? Um, uh, like you take a manual and gives you instructions, step one, step two, step three, you're not sure if you don't see the final picture, you're not sure what's the final picture, but you can follow the steps until you finally you see, oh, okay, you say that was a chair. Let's say I had to assemble. Um, so it's a little bit like that. But as you train yourself, maybe you start then understanding more things and it, it works a little bit different. Um, so that's, um, that's when I'm working with instruments. Uh, when I'm working with electronic sounds only, um, it's a similar to, yeah, Pedro, Pedro Pitancourt, that's the, um, uh, Pedro was, uh, it was written for Pedro Rhino, the piece. Uh, he did amazing work uh, on this piece. Um, so when, uh, when I, I work with instruments, uh, I, I, I follow with electronics, I follow a similar 
uh, approach, but this time it's more uh, a studio process. There's no intention to go out and play in front of audience, right? I just do it, I record it, and then I further process it and stuff. Uh, some of you may already know uh, uh, my paper on fab synthesis uh, that has also been published in um, uh, in there. Um, and um, in fab synthesis, I take different uh, models and approaches to making sound. So here I will show you just a little video. Unfortunately, I cannot make it bigger. This is a DVD. Okay, unfortunately the idea is I have the, the, the PowerPoint open so I can drag and make them bigger but because now I'm working with a, within a tab in Chrome it doesn't allow me to stretch the window and make it bigger kind of, uh, yeah, it gives me some limitations so this is how I generated the sounds for the piece of mine I wrote in 2010 called Construct Synthesis fixed media piece, right? Um, so I recorded this kind of sounds here now you'll hear uh, a section exactly from the DVD and then how I integrated that into the piece this is just DVD Okay, uh, and now you will hear exactly the same sounds you've heard it now in the context of uh, with other sounds together and processed sounds in the piece. Construct synthesis. So you hear how it evolves, and but you see where the sound came from, right? Uh, in the case of instrumental music, that will be, let's say, the violin on stage. But here, I don't, I don't do that. It's, it's fixed media. If you want to know more about fab synthesis, Daniel uh, Coranta is uh, uh, was involved in this project and published uh, my paper on fab synthesis a few years ago. Uh, I think this edition exists in uh, in Spanish. Um, but uh, yeah, you may want to look into that uh, and uh, find out more. So that was um, um, Fab Synthesis, as I call Modo 1, where it involves mostly the hands. Now I'll show you an example from a, another piece of mine called AI Fantasy, uh, which I wrote in 2020. And, and that's uh, what I call Fab Synthesis Mode 2, which involves uh, uh, our hands, but also um, electromechanical devices and you'll see what I mean unfortunately uh, it's a small image maybe I can figure out uh, it's okay I think you can see it so here I, I constructed this pipe wheel you see there uh, and uh, they're all different sizes lengths but same uh, diameter and then I, I created the motor that rotates so that wheel rotates and um, in various speeds and then I hold also a compressor and I blow air so I don't blow with my mouth I don't rotate it with my hands I use machines but still my hands are involved right 
So that's the mode two. Let's play the video. Not very loud. That's an airbrush. People paint with it, but here I'm using a straw. Okay, so all sorts of different variations. Uh, I made all different wheels. So here I will show you, I will play also um, just the wheel sounds. Okay, so these these are all sounds that came from that uh, construction there, that little instrument I made, and here in the context of the piece. And so on. Um, so another example I will not show much. This is a smaller one with straws. Kind of soprano wheel. Uh, I will not show more. Uh, I will just move on and um, show you another uh, variation. In this case, I'm using a vacuum cleaner. So. Have the vacuum tube, then different membranes. This actually is a glove, and I just cut it and I have the, the surface of it across the vacuum cleaner tube, and as it's sucking air, it creates vibrations. So I have a machine that creates a sucking mechanism. I don't do it by, my, by myself but I'm holding it with my hands, right? So that's the second mode of fab synthesis. I'll just jump here. There. Other surfaces, plastic. So I will turn on and off the, the vacuum cleaner also. My vacuum cleaner has kind of intensity depending on what we want to vacuum. So th this will, it's almost like a little control over the sucking uh, intensity, like you blow in different intensities. Uh, so here I have the, the, the vacuum cleaner recorded sounds, and then I will play how it's integrated into the piece. Oops, yeah. So that's enough, uh, and now within the context of the piece, exactly the same sounds. And 
so on. So Beethoven, you know, had his motives and themes, melodic themes. For me, my theme is uh, this kind of sound object that has all this potential of development and evolution. So it's a, it's a different approach to what theme or melody is somehow, but it's still the same idea. It's something that contains somehow the DNA of the entire piece. So here you, you hear this kind of the, the DNA of the piece, which cannot be all around. It's something very focused and very specific, yet enough to build an entire piece, right? Uh, I, just for the history, I will show you also a third mode fab synthesis, which in this case, there is no more contact uh, of the, the human agent. There is no human agent, it's all, uh, all mechanical, electromechanical. So here I have a robotic arm that does the job of my hands. And what I can do, I can control the robotic arm remotely. It's small, but maybe you can see. So this is uh, the robot there. You see this little black thing. It's adjusting the air to get sound. So I do that remotely with uh, the computer, an iPad. And it's very small, 0 0.02 millimeter changes. So it changes the angle over the bottle. So it blows on the bottle with some angle. And then there's another wheel with bottles, not with tubes or pipes. So that's the way I'm, I'm working with, um, with electronic sounds, which, as you see, I mean, a lot of them are not electronic, but they use a lot of technology like robotics, uh, computers, recording. Uh, but yet the human factor is there and it's essential in the first at least stage of this process. Um, I will play a little bit of a piece of mine um, called uh, Stone Age. Let's see, which is um, for cello and electronics. Uh, Stone Age, there you go, Stone Age. So for this piece, similarly, I developed a, a special bow. Uh, I call it Rasping Bow with Guiro Bow Frog. So this is the Rasping Bow. And in Brazil, you have instruments that are doing things like that. Um, and this is the, the, the frog, which I call it Guido bow. So the frog, as you see, it's kind of has different textures and sides to, to do different things on the strings. So there's no hair, horse hair, whatever. There's no such a thing. It's just 3D printed all of it. And um, it's, uh, it's working like that. So here I have a few examples I will show you. which imitates a little bit a car passing by, maybe, you know. This is more like insect. What I was saying before, that the, the outside world comes in to the concert hall. So even if I'm using traditional instruments, I still play with this imitation with nature, with animals, with the insects, with the elements. And so on. Uh, of course, as always, then I have to develop specific notation, and these are different images I developed to demonstrate different techniques of the bow on the score. And I made I make all those things uh, my scores in finale. I don't use anything else. These are all finale made internally. 
uh, and different uh, terms, terminology is also important because there's no such a kind of terminology, you know. So I have sounds like rasp fan, angled rasping, rasp roll toad, rasp trem, rasp rattling, you name it. Frog click and so on. Um, so the score looks a little bit like that. Uh, the, you, you see the cello, let's say, profile, or it can be any string instrument, as a matter of fact, low to high. And it shows where you place your left hand across the board and where you place the bow, which is, again, across the board. Because you can put the here, for example, the, the, the bow goes from bottom to top. So you bow up here. Um, and I have also an area which is called sound. And this is quite common in my scores. Uh, and uh, I here I create some sort of graphic representation of the sound, which I guess again I think is important. You see how to what to do mechanistically, but you're not sure how it should sound. So this gives you a little idea that this is different from that, and in between there is something different too. Uh, so as you do what I instruct here, you can figure out things. Uh, so that helps. Um, and I think it's a very essential part of the sound composition notation for instruments. Um, so I will um, move on and just play maybe maybe an example first of what I call um, analysis or synthesis techniques. Let me find maybe a one a good example to show you. Um, let's try that one. So. Here and what I mean when I say analysis or synthesis, I analyze uh, sounds, could be sounds from nature, mechanical sounds, other instrumental sounds, you name it. Uh, and then I resynthesize them either electronically or acoustically. So here I do it with a cello actually in this specific bow. So here is the cello that's here. We hear the sound. We hear the electronics, which has this uh, insect sounds, and then in context. So you hear that it, it fits very well in the context, and this analysis or synthesis allow me to uh, recontextualize sounds that are coming from the instrument and repurposed. So all of my music is full of this kind of approaches and uh, Techniques. So I will play uh, Stone Age uh, for cell and electronics. It's uh, an eight minutes long.
Yep, um, so this is uh, Stone Age. If you search, you can find, uh, of course, the piece online in a score follower version or even with performers if you want to see what the performer is doing. Um, so you've heard uh, all sorts of different things here, right? From cars, from horses to uh, frogs, insects, um, which is coming from this analysis or synthesis approach I was talking to you earlier on. Now, um, I would like to, to, to move on with more discussion and questions and answers, but I'm thinking to try to change now the tab and play on more peace of mind. This is a piece I did a couple of years ago, I think, uh, and uh, I would like to play a piece that is uh, more recent. It's like uh, a couple of weeks old. So let's see if I can... Uh, I will stop sharing and to again share my screen by different tab so bear with me okay share there you go um, so this piece is called um, useless box 2023 and is for box operator and electronics um, so i will not say much because i just want to play and then maybe we can talk and maybe i can show you more um, uh, while I'm uh, while we're talking, uh, I'll just give you an overview of what's going on in this piece. Um, this piece involves what I call um, where is um, the slide? Here is the slide. Um, um, it has a kind of a trifecta. It has 
three elements. It's a sense, the thing, and the act. That's what per basically a performer does, right? It senses the environment, the instrument, thinks, processes, controls the instrument by acting, right? Um, so in this piece, to do that, I'm doing it as a performer, but also my instrument does that. So it extends that approach also to the instrument. I'm using robotics. I'm using Maximus P extensively, 3D printing, AI, machine listening, uh, of course, notation, uh, 3D sound, uh, a lot of different technologies that are current and traditional in the performance practice and the uh, instrumental performance practice and the computer music performance practice. So, um, so the hero in this is a box, apparently, this is for a box operator. Oh gosh, it doesn't show the full image here. Uh, that's strange. I don't even see it. Maybe I will just show that. Maybe it will just load it. Let me see if um, if it will load the the page. Maybe it needs some time. It's a box which is called useless box, and maybe if you search online. You can find a lot of videos on YouTube with this useless box. Um, it doesn't show that. Oh, there you go. It came up. So this is a useless box. And normally, if you buy one of those, you switch the... It has a switch here. You switch on, and then a little lever comes out and closes it back. Okay, so, and that's what it does. And therefore, they call it a useless box. So I took one of those boxes, and I completely remodified it. I inserted inside sensors, actuators, and then an analog to digital brain, which is here. Um, and then it communicates the box, which is performed by the, the box operator via the, the system here, the sensors sent to the software, which is a maximum speed patch that speaks to live Ableton, that speaks back to the actuators of the box, that react to the box. So it's this this loop and uh, it creates a very interesting model for performance practice and uh, music. So I will just go ahead and play. It has also a score. I will show you a little bit the score. So here the score represents the box and tells the performer, the box operator, um, which part of the box to move. Here is the switch up and down. It says toggle. So you know which part it should, you should uh, play with or uh, tap it, knock the top of the of the box and so on, shake it. So it doesn't require video. It's live performance, but imagine uh, to travel or to move around with this uh, cable thing, it's, it will be hard to pass it through the airport. So a video is always an easy way to document that. So it's a little bit long piece, about uh, 13 minutes. Um, but after that, I'm um, all yours. So.
So that's a uh, um, useless box, as useless as it can, it can be. Uh, so that's a one of perhaps the most recent work of mine, just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective and range of my creative output. Uh, so I will put here a, a full stop and, uh, I don't know, ask if you have any questions or Anything you would like to ask, to talk, uh, as I normally say, jokes, uh, complaints, you name it. Wow, wow amazing. amazing. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for your lecture. So, so, so much, much stuff, stuff and so many ideas. ideas. Um, um, so I think, so think we can see it with the questions, like you said. I don't know if don't people know if have you questions. Have questions. I, 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 uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post my my question. Sure. And present to you. One second. So then people have time to to formulate that. So uh, this useless box. Uh, show how much more than sound 
is at stake. Uh, how touch, visuals, and even irony became parameters in vision. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's uh, exactly to the point, uh, Philippe. Um, I think this is an advantage of the sound composition. Uh, with sound composition, I can uh, create images, I can create uh, memories, emotions, um, uh, I can create, uh, um, how to say, theatricality and humor in a much more efficient way, in my opinion, uh, than I could do it with just using intervals and harmony. Um, I feel when I, I deal with that, I, I have difficulty doing that, creating all these uh, possibilities. And uh, also, I have also, just, I'm struggling with uh, repetition, like it reminds me something. So sound composition offers to me this, this opportunity to express all these things that sound carries in. Every sound has all these things, has theatricality in it. If I, if I make this sound, you hear a gesture that is something is moving like in a rotational manner. Perhaps you may say, perhaps it's two palms, and it reminds you that if you feel cold and you create friction to warm up, let's say, all these are in the sound. And then you can I use all these possibilities in the composition. So it's not only spectromorphological evolution in the piece, but it's also what uh, is called transcontextuality. So I use the context of the sound, the meanings, the symbolisms of the sound to transform the sound. Okay, so, um, and that's exactly what happens with the useless box. Um, and yes, indeed, it's very theatrical, it's very uh, evocative, and it makes a lot of commentaries in, in various things. Uh, will there be a Russo low Thank influence you. in this work, especially? Yeah, that, that in his last example. That's uh, from a cell phone. Yeah. Um, well, you know, everything began from Russo. Every computer music class will start from more than 100 years now ago um, with Russo and his ideas. Uh, the idea is that, yeah, Russo was one of those who stated that every sound is possible and it can be musical. And that's what I totally believe and think. Uh, and as you see, it's not an, a new idea. It's it's more than 100 years old. Um, and he used all these uh, uh, machines to create noises and imitate also uh, other sounds from the Industrial Revolution that, revolution that was going at that time. Um, so he's the father of all this, I would say. Um, Maybe uh, I can show you, I will share again while you're maybe thinking uh, what to write um, on slide relevant to this. Let me share again my screen. Uh, show screen and here. So for instance, the piece has, um, uh, I think, 13 sections. So the first section is called Pandora's box, uh, and there is a story behind Pandora. It's a Greek uh, mythology. I will just read you the story. It's uh, there also, but it's interesting. So the god Prometheus stole fire from heaven and gave to human gave to give the human race, which originally consisted only for men. So at that time, human race was only men. Um, to punish humanity, the other gods created the first woman, the beautiful Pandora. As a gift, Zeus uh, gave her a box which he was told never to open. However, as soon as he was out of sight, Pandora took off the lid and out swamped all the troubles of the world, never to be captured again. Only hope was left in the box, stuck under the lid, Anything that looks ordinary but may produce unpredictable harmful results can thus be called the Pandora's box. So that relates to the piece very much as well and kind of uh, speaks to me. And the, the way the piece begins is a little bit of exploration, like what is this? I'm tapping it, I'm shanking it, but I don't open it yet. I'm kind of 
curious, create this, I create this curiosity around the box before I first start opening it. And when I open the first time, we hear this song, this piece by uh, a Czech uh, composer. Let's see if I can play that. I don't know if you can hear something. Maybe not. Um, so it's a piece, this tin 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 So this is a piece called Angel of Gladiators. It's a march by Czech uh, composer Julius uh, Fucic. Um, so, and then it reveals its internal components. Um, so there's all sorts of things. Um, there is a section um, which I call uh, Poe Automata. Um, where is this? Maybe it's here. And let me play a little bit of that. Maybe it doesn't like to play now again because it's loading. Well, um, and there I'm using some music, organ music that is played uh, in the stadiums, mostly in the US. So that also creates a, a very interesting extension of the end of the gladiators, which is also kind of uh, organ based often music and uh, it connects the crowd, the arena, with the piece and the music and uh, all these reactions. Uh, yes, for some reason these videos now are not playing. I guess it's the page that doesn't doesn't load. Uh, well, I will just jump in here a few 3D printed pieces for the box. I had to, to print them out. Um, to facilitate different functions. The smoke that you saw comes from this uh, vapor, e-vape cigarette. It's an electric, electric cigarette that I hacked. And instead of uh, smoking in, I press air with a little pump that I have. Let me find that pump to show you. Um, I have some of all the components of the piece here. So this pump blows air into that electric cigarette which has inside uh, glycerin and creates smoke, like you normally do actually when you smoke, but in this case, I'm not sucking it, I'm pushing it out from here. Um, and um, there is various microcontrollers. There is a sensor that controls, that checks uh, distance for how far I'm from the box. Uh, this sensor sits just here behind, and you saw perhaps there is a little wall, a hole, uh, so that sensor watches me. Uh, can control distance from the box. Um, here's the cigarette, the electronic cigarette. Um, there is lights, there is this disco ball kind of thing. There is two red LEDs. There is an LED at the edge of the switch. And there is a white LED here, you see. Um, there is a, a microphone, piezo microphone here that captures the sounds when I do tapping. That's what knows uh, that I'm tapping. And here there is also a gyroscope. So there's various sensors and various actuators, the motors, the fan that blows the, the smoke. There's a fan as well. You don't see, and various switches. There's a switch here that knows when the lid is open and closed, and the switch here, which uh, you see me playing through. So Francesco Cardoso asks something, I think. We have been listening to your pieces from stereo perspective. Is speciality incorporated into your um, uh, composition process rethought uh, in the live performance of your works. Um, yeah, speciality is big. Uh, I'm, I'm working with, uh, and this piece also has a, an eight channel version uh, for the electronic part. And uh, all my pieces are implemented also in multi channel versions. I have versions for multi channel and stereo. Um, and uh, uh, the piece you've heard, AI Fantasy, with the straws and the tubes rotating, that I have a version for Abisonics. I have a version for uh, VBAP, uh, multi-channel diffusion. Uh, so yeah, it's a big part of my work, the multi-channel and the, the, the sound in space, as a matter of fact, right? Um, because that's how we experience sound, in space. And uh, when I use instruments, I normally just take advantage of the of the stage. I don't go beyond that, but you never know. Maybe in the future I may integrate also parts of the stage um, uh, outside of the stage. 
also in other states works I have done, I use the whole area. Um, I hope that answers a little bit that question about spatiality. And uh, also, I think it's a little unusual to do humorous pieces. They are usually dramatic or dark. Could you talk more about the mood of contemporary music composition? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, I like humor. I like jokes, <laughs> and uh, um, if my music it's a reflection of me, it should have that too, right? Um, so I don't pretend, and I try to convey my personality and my character into my music as well. Um, without a specific intention. All of my pieces have a little bit of humor and uh, a playful kind of tone, uh, if you listen to. So that's me. And I guess it comes through. I also, I also have another have question. question. I have sure. tons of questions, so. But it is... Um, let me put it here. I think there's a little bit of echo. Can you, can you still hear me? I hear you very well, yes. Well, okay. So here's my question. Uh, you compose a lot for music media take. I understand that a lot of what you do needs the gestural sculpting done inside the studio. Uh, what are the kinds of working with live electronics? Uh, just to clarify, I, think, uh, I, I wrote this question down at the beginning, but I see that you do a lot of electronics. So, uh, what what is your uh, thoughts of doing studio work? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I've done I've done a lot of live electronics. I'm still doing it. So this with uh, just most recent piece as well. Um, um, unfortunately, that's my perspective. A lot of performers still do not embrace electronics. They go to music school, they study for 12 years an instrument, and they have no idea how to play a piece with electronics. Even fixed media electronics, like with click track, pedal, you name it. A simple, simple, simple setup, uh, let alone if that involves live electronics, which is Max MSP, Super Collider, other tools. They are not educated for that. And that's a problem because if you if you want to spend 50 hours practicing the piece, these 50 hours must be with electronics, not without electronics, and then go to the dress rehearsal where somebody else will run the electronics. So that's a little bit disappointing in my opinion. And uh, when I work with instruments, most of the times I do fixed media, uh, fixed electronics and instruments. So the performer can have this at home, practice and learn the piece. Uh, and like with Daniel Vargas, he's playing the piece with no click track, as a matter of fact, um, because he he doesn't need that. He he has learned the piece and the piece uh, guides him, right? So it's more or less like live electronics, in fact. Um, <clears throat> you don't feel this restriction. It's like you play a concert with an orchestra and the orchestra has its own rhythm and you, you go around it. Um, but yeah, when I do live, uh, let's say, improvisational things, I will use live electronics my, for myself. And it's a little bit ephemeral. You know, it's happening. It will not happen again exactly like that. Uh, the, one of the disadvantages there is that I may lose detail. As you see, and you said, my pieces are very well sculptured. sculptured, sculptured. I'm a, like a little um, designer for jewelry. Very detailed, very precise things which you cannot get in live electronics for the most uh, most of the times. Uh, so that's a little bit of a barrier for me. Uh, but nowadays that we have AI, for instance, and machine learning and listening, I can do more. For instance, in the music, in the box piece, the useless box, there's a section where I'm scratching the box. And there there is a machine listening, machine learning algorithm uh, where it listens what I'm scratching and plays sounds relevant to what I'm scratching. So it has learned what kind of uh, scratch I'm going to do. It's been trained. I have a corpus of sounds that they have been analyzed. And then according to what I'm doing, if I tap it, it will do piano sounds uh, banging. If I do with my nails, it will do scratching the strings. And it does that automatically uh, through machine listening and machine learning. Uh, 
that was not possible five years ago. Uh, you basically had to either make effects with live electronics or uh, trigger things. It was kind of limited. Other things too as well. Uh, Davis pieces which are rather sophisticated, of course. But it was more limited and less precise in, in my language. So that's why I was not, uh, I'm not doing much with live electronics and live instruments, but most fixed electronics live instruments. But I use live electronics in other contexts, as you saw in the music box, wherever it's useful to me. But that varies depending on your musical language. That's my, my style and it doesn't fit very well. That's why. Yeah, I, I can give you a, a, an example with uh, rehearsed piece. I'm just showing uh, in the, the, the subtitles that Mark is going to play your piece next week. There you go. And it's, uh, it's interesting because uh, since the first rehearsal, he was already the entire thing. Because, like you said, he studies with electronics. It's, it's all with his, uh, uh, it's part of his ear, right? Yes. And, um, and our people, I mean, now they're incredible, they're beautiful concert, but we uh, perhaps five uh, rehearsals in order to get electronics right. Yeah. It takes so much to, to, to understand what we're doing. And uh, so, yeah, it, uh, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, this is a technical, practical thing, you know. And if that was all, I wouldn't perhaps rely. I wouldn't bother um, because the musical idea is above these practicalities and logistical logistical problems. But it's something for sure to consider. But for me, the most important is that I'm, the way I make music is very sculpted, very detailed, very precise. That is difficult to convey with traditional live electronic tools. Uh, but that's, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, and it doesn't mean we shouldn't try because we're getting closer even to that. Uh, so uh, there's a question from Flora. Would you have any suggestions on how we can pedagogically approach sound uh, composition with uh, this type of holistic approach, for example, in music and technology laboratories at universities in Brazil? You know, the, the first example, perhaps the first lesson maybe for intro to sound composition would be a sound walk. Just uh, people should, uh, and students, you know, uh, performers and composers included, should understand that listening is not given. It's, it's an approach and it's a, there is something to learn there too. And often, you know, I ask my students to go and record, let's say, um, a water pond somewhere. And they will say, well, you know, it was very noisy. There were birds and there were cars passing by and people talking, so the water was not clear. But that's that's one way of listening. Uh, why don't you then embrace those and don't make them part of the soundscape and make them useful instead of being resistant to this and say, oh, this noise around me bothers me from listening to the water. It's not like that, actually. It's all together. And they are, they are making your uh, surrounding uh, experience more complete, as a matter of fact. Uh, so through a sound walk experience, people realize that uh, there is a different way to appreciate our surrounds sonically. And uh, then uh, when they listen things in a concert hall, they can relate differently and they can uh, then understand better what's happening especially with 3D sound, for example, when you start hearing birds passing by and moving like it happens outside. Um, they can relate to that and they say, oh, yeah, I've heard that in our sound walk, for instance, you know, or in this uh, experience I had. So that's one thing. And then just learn to play music with everything. Here you just saw a piece using a useless box. Um, and you can do wonderful things using that uh, that uh, useless box uh, and openness to sound possibilities uh, we don't need to just struggle for 15 years to learn how to play um, a capriccio by Paganini right uh, I mean that's great and those who want to do that is great but I'm a little bit opposed to that as well 
I, I studied for many years classical guitar, I have a degree in classical guitar. Um, but perhaps why I need to spend 12 years to learn the guitar and feel like, you know, I know how to play in order to play music. Um, the, the, the example here, again, with a useless box is like, you don't need to spend 12 years in the conservatory to play contemporary music or to play music and to feel good about it. Even similar with the cello piece you saw, that bow has no hair and doesn't require a lot of the training you're supposed to do for years to get even one note right. Uh, so I'm, I'm also challenging that approach, like what's a performance practice and why it has to be this way? Uh, good work, you mentioned improvisation and making electroacoustic music in real time. Very of people you know been researching and experimenting with that. Well, I guess a lot of people do that. Um, I guess most of the live electronics uh, thrives in this world, in the experimental improvisational world. And uh, David Tudor and John Cage, if you know uh, back uh, at the time, there was no the idea of live electronics at the time was not exactly the same we have today, but they were doing live electronic processing and uh, uh, they were using microphones and speakers and transducers and stuff like that um, in a rather improvisational context. And also there you can see that was one of the amazing contributions. They were the performers of their works. That's an interesting approach. It was not very common before then, like David Tudor and John Cage and uh, the likes. The, normally there was a separation, like I'm the composer sitting on my desk with paper and piano and I'm composing and then you're the performer, you play. And that was not always also the case. It, it became like that uh, in the 20th, 21st century. Uh, Beethoven, Mozart, we just mentioned Bach, they were performers, very good performers as well. So they were very much connected to it. And it was hard for them to separate those tasks. At some point, we completely disconnected that. Um, so yeah, David Tudor, for example, he's, he used the live electronics and electroacoustic sounds and all the stuff in an improvisational set. And he was a performer, he was a composer, he was the producer, the tech guy, everything. He was doing everything. It was an interesting model. And again, I embraced that model, as a matter of fact, and with that thing you saw with the music uh, useless box, I'm doing physical computing, soldering cables, I am printing, 3D printing fabrication, I'm sculpting sound with spectromorphology, I program with Max MSP. So I perform it in the end, you know. Uh, I'm doing all of these tasks that traditionally these are not what a composer is supposed to, to be doing. But I think today, why not? We can do that all. Do you think about hacking instruments? Portuguese campiara, English make to work around Greek paragamsi. Good, uh, good point, <laughs> paragamsi. Um, it's more than that. Um, for me, paragamsi or campiara, as you say, um, it suggests there is a straight way, the right way. And then there's a way to go around it somehow. But in my opinion, actually, I don't think like that. If, let's say, I'm coming from Mars, I'm living there in Mars, never been, I'm a Martian, right? And come here and you give me a violin. I'm not going to hold it like that and start bowing. 100%. I've never seen violin. I know, I've no, I know nothing about human beings, right? I'll perhaps... Uh, crash it on the floor like that, boom, boom, right? And maybe for me that would be a fun way of playing the violin. And I say, you know, I discovered a new instrument in uh, in Earth, planet Earth, and um, it's actually played like that. And I might do this and send it a video on uh, TikTok, let's say, in Mars. Um, uh, so I feel like uh, I'm just trying to see the instruments in their fuller possi possible potential uh, uh, existence. So why we have to necessarily 
hold the violin like that, right? And play. Even a few hundred years ago, it wasn't like that. It was a viola da, da braccio. So they were holding it here and playing, or even viola da gamba. So this is a new thing, and it's one way to play it. I can play it also like that, like lira they play sometimes. Um, so it's not necessarily a way to, to avoid one path, one direction, one norm. It's more to expand it and just make sound with all the ways that are possible. Um, that's, that's how I think of it, which is more holistic way. Um, I don't know if that's a question from Daniela, from Daniela Flautista. Uh, it's, uh, I can translate it, but maybe you can do it. I don't hear you though now. I think you have your microphone closed. Uh, good. I don't hear you. Uh, I, no. I, I think it's, it's not a question. But, uh, okay. Um, so again, yeah, that's that's how I think about the instruments and hacking. Um, which is more, which is more expanding. <laughs> it's, it's more expanding. <laughs> it was interesting. It's more expanding, not, not hacking, I would say. Although, yeah, I agree with the term hack. and But it's more expanding. Hacking to expand the possibilities and the options and the, the, the perspectives. Yeah, I, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the question is because we... Um, uh, Usually when uh, I'm speaking from a Brazilian perspective of sometimes students don't having access to a string quartets or orchestras and electronic music sometimes is a, is a window, is an opportunity to, um, uh, I mean, for, for creation, first of all. And I think it's inherent in electronic composition the idea of, like the, the DVD example you, you mm -hmm. gave, so the DVD is some, it's a media to watch the movie, for instance. That's right. that, and uh, the, the, the weird sound for just uh, manipulating the object. So uh, um, I, I, I think words are tricky, but the idea is that... Um, do you, um, I mean, what is the difference of working with the cello or the, the sax piece for the tool for Pedro and then the bomb, the useless box piece? Mm. One, one side you have this um, tradition, you, you're working with tradition, and with players, play Bach, etc. But on the other hand, it's more a bricolage. Hmm. Uh, are there different things uh, um, good, good point. Um, there's no difference. And as a matter of fact, I have a, a slide for that. Uh, let's see if I can uh, pull it out to you. Um, where, where are you here? Let me share again, uh, and I will share a slide with you. Present, share screen. Okay, sure. Um, we'll just need to. So uh, I will. I guess it will load um, shortly. So here I have an example exactly what you said. I play a sound on a cello, and then I play a kind of the same sound electronically recorded, uh, and I say so. What is the difference between um, a sound that I play on the cello and the sound that is electronic sound. And the point I make, the sound is the medium. Uh, sound as medium. So let me, now I guess you see it, let me play the first sound. So I, this is the electroacoustic medium, right? I guess it needs some time to load now the, the audio. Uh, so I say that the sound is both the medium and the message. That comes from a philosopher, uh, Marshall McLuhan, who wrote this book, uh, the, sound, uh, the, 
the the message is the medium um, and uh, in my case the message is not the medium the sound is both the medium and the message there's no difference if we have electronics there's no difference if we have instrument voice or if we have just the soundscape just out in the woods it's the sound and you can use different mediums to play with the sound but there's no difference i make crickets in the studio crickets with a cello crickets in the forest and the sound is the the the, the one that connects all of these different approaches so that hopefully that answers your question i cannot play the sounds unfortunately it's, um you know trying to load the, the file but this is a very long file very big uh, presentation so it's i'll just stop sharing but you saw the slide i think that's that's good um so i hope that answers your, your point there which is yeah it's it's true to make things simple just i focus on the sound and the sound uh, controls everything it, it sound the sound doesn't distinguish western instrument from brazilian traditional instruments from nature from human made or from electronic sounds uh, it's all one and my electronic works from my instrumental works do not sound very different either partly because of that because i don't think when i use an instrument that i should just take advantage of what an instrument is supposed to be i just use it as a as a sonic object and just make sounds with it like i would do with anything else um, so what breezes everything is just the use of sound perfect thank you uh perhaps we have time for one last question i don't know if you're typing or not um just a comment while people think about asking the next question um, we're used to those uh, terms, additive synthesis, subtractive synthesis, and when you presented the, the, the term uh, allophony, uh -huh. it reminded me of something. I mean, I mean, it sounded to me as like organic synthesis uh, because you're. You're, it's like the Fourier uh, concept of adding mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. things and reaching something uh, co complex. Yeah. Uh, but then again, you, you you work a lot of perhaps not your entire works, of course, but it seems that you're interested in capturing forces. Does that make sense? Um, I'm capturing what? Forces. Yeah, I mean, all these are, are, are here, you know, they exist, they're truths. And the point is how maybe you you focus on them and re reinforce this truth. So, yeah, Fourier and the, the idea that every sound consists of uh, sign tones, you know, that we don't distinguish them, but they hear them as a timbre. Uh, it's, it's actually a, a, a way of holophonic musical texture in in a, in a mono version like you don't have many instruments you have just one instrument and then if you can manipulate that timbre you almost create some sort of holophonic version in a, in one instrument right um, uh, but the same happens if you start then combining sounds and if you if you get an analog synthesizer and you have let's say three oscillators the point is not for me to build a sound that sounds like a, a chord but I combine the oscillators to create a new sound, a new single sound. But actually, it consists of multiple oscillators. Uh, so uh, an analog synthesis approach is very holophonic too. But the goal there is just to create a single sound, right? So the holophonic approach uh, is now applied more in the building a single sound, which is also valid. Uh, but uh, when it goes to the musical texture then is how we combine them right uh, so we have the violin we have the piano we have the flute and then 
what timbers do I need to, to use there in order to fuse them? And uh, there is a lot of tools nowadays uh, in, in the music information world where you can analyze the sound and can tell you this is similar to that sound. And if two sounds are quite similar, they fuse together better. And therefore you can create this kind of holophonic textures in a more successful way. And that's what I do. I, I record many sounds, I analyze them, and then I group them. Similar, dissimilar, and I kind of organize them in a fashion where I can then work around and create different functionalities, let's say. So, but our ears also doing that. So you don't need necessarily technology to do all these things. You can trust your ears. We are a very intelligent computer anyways, all, all of us. All right, so uh, I think we're reaching the end of uh, this first day of our event. Uh, so I would like to thank you again, uh, for your lecture, amazing lecture, where uh, I'm sure people are having tons of ideas of what is possible to do with composition. And uh, so congratulations on your work. It sounds amazing. Uh, thank you very much. Again, uh, congratulations on the uh, wonderful festival you organized now for six years. And uh, I hope you will enjoy on-site and online uh, the rest of the events. I will also try to follow uh, the online portion of it. Um, and uh, I will send you good vibrations uh, when Daniel Vargas is playing the, the piece <laughs> uh, later in November. Uh, and um, thanks to all of you. All right, thank, thank you, Bukovas. Thank you, Ricardo.